uh, I'm going to talk about some <laughs> of uh, introduction of uh, toward building ARM um, ecosystem. So it's a half a slide almost <laughs> same as an uh, ISC workshop. <laughs> but so many people attend the ISC uh, workshop, so I added some slides for the maybe a main part of a S64FX processor. So however, uh, rest of the slide, I can use some of the slides will scope to. Uh, skip the uh, sorry. So here, oh, hmm? oh, this one. Okay. So here is my outline in my talk. Uh, so first, uh, I'm talking about uh, ARM-based supercomputer development. So mainly uh, focusing on uh, introduction of A64 FX processor, uh, which is uh, printed by uh, hot chips. Also, uh, into this, uh, last week, uh, cluster 2018, we will present some uh, uh, TOFD uh, new interconnect. So I talk about some uh, both of things. Uh, after that, I talk about some uh, almost same slide uh, using uh, ARM HPX sim development. So let's talk about the next thing. So first of all, uh, I took, uh, I'd like to introduce the uh, A64FX high performance ARM CPU. <laughs> That's very different. So this is uh, also present as uh, four chips and class 16. So Future has been uh, developing uh, HPC processor uh, for 40 years. So this kind of processor is inheriting future HPC CPU technologies with commodity standard ISA. That is very different from uh, all, all uh, previous CPUs. So I'll talk about uh, some uh, detail. Uh, here's the all same uh, slide as hot chips. So A64 chips overview. So architecture is uh, maybe, as you know, uh, ARM-based uh, 8.2 uh, ARM architecture. However, six bit only, uh, six four bit only, and all, as you know, uh, no, SP five twelve bit uh, simulator, and also uh, uh, forty eight computing cores with four assistant core, and uh, left side the view is uh, okay. Uh, this is slides over some architecture. There are four kind of CMGs, so HBM two and the inside. This is twelve and one. Assistant quantum for uh, chip core management group and TOF interconnect and PCI Express. And also, yeah, this CPU is made in a uh, uh, seven nanometer thin fat technology. It's uh, around uh, nine giga transistors and maybe also the 600 pins. Also, the peak performance is also, I mean, peak performance is 2. teraflops. And uh, also, with the over 90% of uh, DGM uh, uh, performance, I talk about the data related. Also, uh, it provides a memory bandwidth of uh, one terabyte per second. Uh, and also 80% uh, of the uh, uh, stream triad uh, performance. And here is some difference of the previous Spark-based CPUs. ISA is changed from the Spark to ARM, and really, uh, ISA is sensing that some uh, with this of uh, uh, SIMD, and maybe HPC S2 in the previous CPU, uh, 225-bit virus SIMD, and uh, SP with uh, 512 bit. And also, uh, uh, CPU technology with increasing the 9 nanometer technology, and SIMD, uh, and SIMD technology is twice, and number of cores is 32 to uh, 448 cores. And memory is changed by HMC to HBM2. And maybe runs all, almost under, uh, four times faster. And here's uh, some uh, architecture of uh, uh, many core architectures. Uh, we are focusing on the four CMGs, uh, core memory management, and TOF and PCI components. And very important thing is that the application is mainly focused on one process and many multiple sets. So into, into the same, same Memories. So, application needs a variety of program, such kind of uh, limited memory uh, locality. So, it's, it, such kind of application is easily uh, provides a higher scalability. That's a very point of a difference of a different uh, architecture of some kind of uh, CPUs. So, uh, and uh, as we, I said, maybe a CMG consists of 13 cores and it's cache and the memory controller. And uh, uh, CMG keeps cache coherence by CC NUMA with uh, on-chip directory. 
And it's very important thing, the crossbar connection. It's very, try to be a connection, realize a high efficiency for the Elitz cash throughput. And also, uh, software provides a new malware software technology to enable linear scalability for up to the 48 cores. And also, uh, it provides a high IO performance by wide ring, uh, wide ring, uh, maybe it is a, it is a bidirectional uh, wide ring on chip network. That's a, a brief overview of the uh, many core architectures. So I talked about some of the memory system and uh, uh, A64 FS provides an extremely high bandwidth to realize a, a higher application performance. Uh, for example, uh, this is a single core, and it provides uh, uh, two reads and one write, it's maybe it's for a whole, to provide a, a whole throughput. So it is, uh, provides a, a read is uh, 230 gigabytes per second, and write performance is 120. Uh, 15 gigabytes per second. And it, it's uh, Reveron cache provides such kind of bandwidth. And also provides uh, some, for the uh, Elitz cache, it also provides us uh, a half of bandwidth. So uh, application user uh, per, uh, thinking about such kind of difference of uh, bandwidth. So it, it's easier to uh, uh, applicable. Also provides a uh, high value memory bandwidth for HBM2, uh, single chip provider, uh, 256 gigabytes per second. And also, uh, Intercore uh, CMG, Core Management Group, so it provides uh, one way, 115 gigabytes and bidirectional. So it is a really uh, high bandwidth. And then the basement of the HBM2 is the same as GPU technology. So it provides as a memory bandwidth, also on top of the uh, cache uh, hierarchy provides uh, high performance. The difference is uh, uh, CPU core is uh, ARM architecture, and not, not the GPU as seen ARM core, such kind of architecture. So here's uh, some uh, A64 core features. So at this time, uh, we optimizing SB architecture of wide range of application with ARM, including uh, AI level, FP16, and Intel 16, and Intel 8 dot product. And and developing a 6 core micro to increase the application performance uh, with the collaboration with the uh, uh, DKN and the application unit developers. And as here's uh, some difference uh, of some previous CPUs, and almost uh, uh, this kind of topics is uh, uh, enhanced, and the new uh, uh, feature is a uh, fast forward load is provided uh, um, SB architecture and on the FP16 and Intel 16 and Intel dot product. So here's a, a six four chip level application performance. Uh, we are going to boost uh, this kind of operations. Uh, here is a, uh, some normalized performance in the previous CPUs. For for example, GCM provides uh, maybe a 2.5 terahertz performance. Uh, this is uh, two, around two times faster than the prior CPU. And uh, StreamYard provides also uh, about uh, uh, 830 gigabytes per second, and uh, all higher than the 80% uh, uh, of the uh, efficiency. So here is a uh, uh, application results for uh, fluid dy dynamics, astronomic here, and semi wave propagation. It's almost higher than the uh, two times faster. And it also some uh, uh, artificial intelligence performance. It's a uh, combination of FT16, and this is kind of highly estimated, but the combination of low percentage or higher. So uh, this just shows uh, ARM CP is already not only a mobile CPU, but also uh, high-end high performance, HPC performance. This realizes uh, some results. So. Uh, <coughs> And next thing is uh, uh, TOF-D interconnect, which included uh, A64 FX CPUs. So uh, the difference of the previous uh, TOF interconnect 2 uh, may be half of uh, of the channels, uh, from the four channels to two channels. Uh, this is because uh, the reason for uh, power and cost reaction. Uh, because uh, uh, high-end CPU is the 
a very important reduction of the power, also have a reduction of cost. This is a um, trade who so provides. And however, that is not half, but uh, increased communication resources to provide a higher performance. Uh, because uh, uh, TNI, that is an uh, uh, interconnect, the number of the interconnect. Uh, previous uh, talk in the on, only uh, four number of interface, HCA, something like the info in, the, in Finland. However, new interconnect by adding two, in the six uh, interface for network interface. So it provides a five, five, 1.5 faster providing injection boundaries. And also, uh, because uh, we reduce the commission latency, this is because the highly scalable uh, uh, system actually provides low latency communication, very important to, uh, uh, to scale. So uh, we limited some patches. So actually, we are, uh, usually uh, very high cost and high latency provides some uh, uh, complicated uh, Margin PCS, so we simplify the uh, uh, PCS to uh, so reduction, uh, almost half of the reduction of the ratings. And also, uh, it provides uh, increasing communication reality, uh, dynamic packet slicing, uh, split and depicted. I don't have enough time to talk about that, but it's uh, also uh, increased uh, reliability. So, so me. <laughs> I talk about some of the uh, 60 dollars because you cannot imagine such kind of 60 dollars mesh. So, uh, TOF provides a 60 uh, dimensional torus mesh, and this is a, a six dimensional X, Y, Z, and ABC. And uh, however, uh, we call this uh, last of ABC is uh, very fixed two by six, three by two. It's like a, a two by three by two. That means that we call the TOF unit. So this uh, unit is provide some uh, 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 provide some uh, different routing for each some uh, interconnect. So it can provide also higher bandwidth, also provides a high reliability. So uh, software can provide some each routing of, <laughs> for example, this can be uh, selected of some routing. The first step is the other 11 can be uh, uh, selected. And also, this is a uh, three-dimensional torus mesh. Uh, so you can imagine one of some components provides such kind of three-dimensional. And three-dimensional into the three-dimensional torus. So this is called a six-dimensional. So I talk about some uh, TOFRI packaging. So here is a CP board of the uh, uh, new system. So here's a single board, but uh, it, it into some uh, two CPU. It includes uh, two nodes in the single package. So we also have some, uh, uh, this is CPU, and this is uh, power and AOC. That means some uh, transceiver for uh, optical interconnect. And here's a RAC packaging. So RAC provides uh, uh, eight shavers, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight. And uh, uh, this is, a, a, it provides a, a 192 CMZ or uh, 350, uh, 84 CPUs. And one shelf uh, can uh, include uh, 24 CMZ, CMUs and CPU management and uh, uh, 48 CPUs. And that's a dimensional like that. And this half and this half of the shelves in, in the, this kind of packaging. So uh, location of the dimensions are decided to the uh, location of the, uh, some racks and some in the slot. So here is uh, uh, some of the trading sheet and sloop and the uh, injection rate. So uh, here is an evaluation by the hardware emulator using the uh, production RT code. Because we, we emulated uh, and tested and almost same realized uh, uh, real uh, communication performance. And we use a simulation model and system level included multiple nodes. And here's a, a 
uh, latency of the communication setting, and TOF, TOF2, and TOFD. And in the TOF uh, case, uh, we have uh, two settings with some uh, uh, reduction of latencies. At the time, time so the TOF is a uh, single one point latency is around 1.15 microsecond, and this is a memory to memory. And uh, a direct register uh, means uh, some of the uh, register uh, to memory. So it reduces uh, uh, 200 nanoseconds. Uh, uh, so at the uh, TOF2 interconnect, that introduces a uh, uh, cache injection technology. So from the off and on reduction of around 100, uh, 100 nanoseconds. And also uh, uh, TOFD provides uh, some uh, uh, simplifying uh, PCSs. It's reduction of uh, almost half of the uh, latency. And uh, as, as you know, I, descri I described some location of the CMGs uh, that they provide are uh, uh, connected by ring topology. There are some uh, di difference to only around uh, 50 nanosecond latency added, but around the, uh, almost a reduction of half of the latency. And also, uh, uh, put through to the, uh, maybe uh, uh, in the TOFD, uh, near half of the channel, so uh, in compared to the TOF2, uh, um, half of the reduction bandwidth. However, uh, using uh, six uh, TNIs, injection rate is maybe uh, 38 gigabytes per second in a single node. It's uh, almost uh, over 93% of the uh, uh, injection performance. So the rest of the slides are almost the same as some ICs. So uh, I talk about some uh, ecosystem presentation. Uh, we are working with a uh, string leadership with ARM HPC community. There are three keywords, some leadership and uh, uh, binary level compatibility and uh, source level compatibility. So for the leadership, ARM is a very, very good great establishment contribution of the ARM HPC base, such as the SPE support of the GC and OpenHP. And we're working with Linaro in uh, building a binary portability on ARM HPC. It's a very important key part of the uh, ARM HPC. And also we are working with uh, OpenHPC and uh, for developing standard IA and ARM HPC software portability. It's very important to keep the uh, software portability is very important to build a higher up uh, uh, HPC X system. And uh, I talk about some uh, um, HPC software topics and activity with Linaro and the OSS open source community and with Linaro and uh, uh, with some OSS community, OpenMPI and Rasta. And brilliant is it. And activities are some different uh, uh, HPC. <laughs> uh, at the time, I see uh, Renato is uh, attended, but uh, uh, at this time, I, I'll talk about that, uh, uh, difference of some uh, IC delivery. So Mr. Okamoto Fujitsu uh, has been selected uh, uh, TSC uh, technical experience of community and PAP, so we are working with uh, Renato uh, uh, with OpenHPC uh, more better. So uh, here's uh, uh, some of the developing status, and uh, there are three kind of topics, and uh, we are working with uh, ARM and Linaro and uh, Eleven Silang for AR Arch64 implement, and is now ongoing. And uh, for example, and uh, three kind of topics, and uh, register allocation, uh, software pipeline support, and vector and simulation, so we are working with uh, that to implement such kind of improvement on the uh, Eleven Silang. And I talk about some uh, two topics and later, and uh, one of the segments, QMSV development, uh, for development uh, SV software development. And, uh, and HQC and HPC compiler quality checker. At, at first, I talk about the uh, uh, QMSV approach status. But uh, it's not so enough time to talk about uh, it is a very uh, important thing. Uh, QMSV approach is uh, usually some tiny code generator. So you convert it in the, for example, I'm um, into some uh, TCG uh, micro operations to uh, evaluation that, uh, for example, uh, IS64 is a uh, protocol provided to the, uh, converted to the IS64, that kind of thing, so. And so, 
their internet, maybe Alex and Richard and Lina are represented in a Lina Connect, and they implement the SE part by extending vectors in the GCG on QM. So it's now on, 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 twice uh, upstreaming, and then finally uh, released in a 2.12 version released in this uh, April. I have, uh, but uh, as Ashok say, said, it's not so system level. So it's finally uh, maybe uh, this August, the new version is coming from. Uh, but uh, not supported wholly, but partially supported. This is ongoing. So I hope we are, with the end of this year, we hope the system is evaluated. <laughs> and I talk about some of these activities at HQC. Uh, this is uh, uh, made by uh, uh, Masaki Arai in his laboratory. And uh, HP security check checks uh, uh, how compared uh, tuned or optimized such kind of thing. So I talk about some uh, uh, using the checker how, what kind of problem, issues, problems are found. So he plans to solve much of thing. I, I talk about some little safety thing. So it's a part of a performance uh, called checkout using uh, GC and LVM. So uh, as uh, he, uh, his results, you know, GC is overall better than the CLANG LVM. So LVM must work harder to improve it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, there's kind of a problem of Silang Levin. Uh, speed calls, uh, more move interactions, and all laser selection, addressing mode, uh, something like that, different emulations. So I talk about some topic, uh, some topic of speed code. So using a, a HPC quality checker, this kind of uh, results are coming. So it's very easy. So it provides some, uh, uh, some diagram. So you can see that uh, LVM is much simpler than GCC. So using this picture, you can find. And I talk about some post as software stack. Uh, post is, as you know, based on uh, SBSA, SBBR. So uh, this uh, kind of provides uh, con um, assurance of, uh, Every uh, binary, including a, a Linux distribution, can be run <laughs> on the same architecture. So this is because we, uh, we selected uh, uh, keeping binary compatibility with the other uh, 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 architecture. So this system is very important to build and make up uh, uh, ARMX system. So as you know, here's a, a Postgre stack. This is used use, uh, almost uh, uh, previous uh, system uh, FX100. So it's uh, using a uh, uh, Linux OS based, using a RAS based file system, and using a uh, uh, OpenMPI MPSH. And also we work around some kind of compiler, an open source compiler. And all the system software is can, uh, if you also look around, this binary also can run with another platform. And also uh, you can provide uh, some uh, their uh, research level, higher level performance, such as lightweight kernel, MC kernel, also Scala MP, and MPSH, and also other advanced system software. So, uh, I don't know, seven minutes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, after the SC slides, so I, I have talked too much about the MPI and the RASA, so I talk about some uh, activities of open MPI. So uh, here's a slide of, uh, presented by uh, SC17. We are working with uh, open the community since the uh, can commit development. It's uh, almost of over five years. And I'll skip uh, some slides. And it's all for K, K computer. And also we support uh, ARM Spark support and continue to uh, implement for the, with the community. And here's uh, working with the last community. Uh, Brent is uh, already working. I met in his warm crowd. And uh, there are two communities, OpenSFS and EOFS. Uh, there are uh, uh, US team in uh, Oak Ridge, South Ola is present. And uh, uh, present in the Franco work uh, uh, with the EU community. So, which is a member of OpenSFS and HPE, and Oak Ridge has uh, many community support. And there are two major events. 
So I talk about some uh, Lhasa Lat 18 uh, next week in Paris. <laughs> I attended the president. So it's not time yet. Time. So I talk of some uh, title with uh, uh, some, uh, this is almost skipped. <laughs> and uh, well, we present some uh, three kinds of topics of IPG website. So we talk of some, uh, uh, yeah, this, you can see the uh, later, maybe uh, this coming up to the, yeah, it's okay. And uh, I like to sum up, no, final, yeah, this is a, uh, uh, Sand X2 in the WAF is a very uh, a met, uh, reference for meteoric application. Uh, this slide shows uh, all the GCC and this is a Skylake and TSCC and it provides that thing. So it is a, a GCC level, it's and, uh, not in the SBE, such kind of SIMD like almost the same performance. And however, using uh, some uh, uh, vector extensions, uh, ABX512, it is increased performance. This can show the uh, increased performance with SVE. So, here's a summary. So, uh, I, I talk about some ARM based supercomputer development, SQ6PFU. It provides a 2.5 teraflops single chip DGM performance. So, this all shows uh, ARM is already not only mobile CP, but also high end CPs. It's, uh, so, I talk about uh, some HP ecosystem development. So that was, thank you very much for that. Perfect, I think we uh, have about two minutes left for questions, and so John's gonna walk around the microphone. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Nope. All right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is going to be Andy Warner from HPE. Oh, take it away. Thank you. Um, first off, say being the last speaker when you're the supplier of many systems that have been talked about before, uh, we may run short here because I'll try and respect your time and not just uh, uh, repeat a bunch of stuff that you've already heard. Um, I specifically want to provide a little bit of perspective. Um, I, I spoke last year, it was you know, basically a year and a week ago, I think. Um, and uh, I want to point out some of the progress we've made. And because it was a research summit and not a marketing event, um, I'd actually really like to um, suggest, uh, point out a couple of areas that I think as a community we've got to, we've got to work in. Um, so I'll just go briefly over um, some of the activities HPE's been up to. I, in fact, could not refer to this by name last year. Um, so I talked about a collaboration that was ongoing and sketched the larger outline of it, but I wasn't authorized to actually um, talk about the Comanche program. Jim Ang from Sandia did that for me quite nicely. He just stood up here and said, oh, we got a Comanche box. Um, so um, people could join the dots without me having to disclose it. Um, so the Comanche collaboration was something that we, uh, in the Advanced Technology Group at HPE, put together um, specifically with the intent of um, growing and uh, developing and uh, pulling together the ARM ecosystem around, uh, uh, around products. Uh, so we committed our skills as a Tier 1 system vendor um, and we, uh, we worked together with the partners you can see on the left-hand side of the screen uh, to deliver systems to interested parties on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, we specifically structured the program so that it was a pilot scheme, it was a prototype scheme, and we worked so that the transition from prototype to product was as smooth as we could make it. Um, so, you know, our goal, as you can see here, was, you know, to provide a hardware platform and to get the same players in the room. So, you know, we got Caviar, Red Hat, Mellanox, Arm, uh, and 
to some extent AMD in the room all together uh, to deliver uh, to deliver a platform. Um, so um, this uh, the next slide shows the timeline that we uh, that we worked on for this. So it actually started. It predates my time at uh, at HPE. I'm Legacy SGI, part of the SGI acquisition. Um, I, I believe it was, uh, you know, it was being talked about long before, uh, you know, still in the days of the Broadcom Vulcan, and then there was a minor hiatus for a little while. Uh, but just going back to when the Comanche program actually got traction, um, you know, it started calendar year 2016, um, you know, putting the plans together. Um, we then um, shipped a small number of... Uh, you know, like handfuls of nodes to, to selected partners in the, uh, in the Comanche program. And we did that early in the year, March, April 2017. And then you can see this is when the ARM Research Summit was last time, which is why I couldn't really talk about it. Um, then we went on to ship wave two of the systems, which were racks of systems. These are, they ranged in size from like 16 nodes to hundreds of nodes. Uh, so it's hundreds of nodes total shipped worldwide uh, to a bunch of customers, a uh, bunch of collaborators, sorry. Um, the net effect is that we started shipping. Um, it's, it's, um, CTR is the internal HP phrase, clear to ramp. Um, uh, you can see where that happened. Uh, and what we were able to do through the Comanche program was accomplish this 16-month window where we could get active community participation. And you know that's uh, you know, customers submitting things. Uh, I talk about some of the uh, some of the deliverables in another slide. But we were able to actually structure a program that let us have a collaborative environment for 16 months ahead of uh, product release, which I think is a very productive model and one we're uh, pursuing. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a model that worked well, I think, this time, and we're looking to duplicate it. Um, so this is the Apollo 70 system. I. I think you've seen variants of this slide several times, so this is, this is one of the uh, savings we'll get. Um, the Catalyst UK program, well, Michelle already talked in more detail about this. So, um, you know, it's, uh, this is, you can see it's a slightly different mix of program partners. It, uh, the timing was different. And, um, you know, HPE, we, we don't play favorites. We, you know, the, the, the Comanche program was with Red Hat and the Catalyst programs with SUSE. It's like, we ship both, we, we like both. So um, the thing about Catalyst, it, it is a pure ARM system. Um, it's ARM login nodes, ARM, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pure ARM system, as I think you heard earlier, when, uh, for, the, for the next system, which gets talked about here, the uh, Vanguard Astra, the Sandia Astra system, you know, we actually, as a, it, that was a commercial enterprise where we, we wanted to submit a bid to Sandia that would not get bounced by, um, uh, by saying, well, we don't believe you can actually deliver this. So, um, and again, you've seen these specs before too. Um, so uh, I believe all the numbers align with the numbers that, uh, that Andrew put up earlier. I'd, I'd hate for there to be skew here. So. Um, one interesting thing is that, um, and I think there's a, um, this uh, echoes some information that, uh, that you saw earlier this morning from Dan at Cray. Um, and if I'd have known you were going to get him to dial in, I would have happily swapped slots with him and he could have got up at a reasonable time. So um, anyway, um, he pointed out that uh, systems were becoming less and less balanced over time. And so uh, we've been observing the same thing. Now, bear in mind the vertical scale here is logarithmic. And, you know, you can, you can haggle about the individual numbers um, and, you know, the exact numbers. But as a rule, you can see there's a definite trend for these key metrics to drop off. So they're going to the, you know, the, uh, as, they, as they move to the right, they're dropping. Um, and these are, these are key, key ratios, like, you know, your, your, the ratio of memory to flops, your ratio of memory, to, uh, memory bandwidth to flops, your ratio of memory, uh, injection bandwidth to flops, etc. So these are going in the wrong direction. And I think that was, the, that was, a, that was a similar message, but a different um, representation than the graph that, uh, that Dan showed this morning. And so one thing about Astra is it starts to, 
starts to reverse that trend, we think. And that's, uh, that's the balanced system approach that, uh, that, again, you saw, you know, one of our competitors talking about uh, this morning. So, you know, Astra, com as compared to Edison, you know, similar peak flops, total memory, but half the number of CPUs. Uh, increased memory bandwidth and 50% of the power. So, um, you know, these are all good things in our world, right? Um, so, this is the way HPE put, toge put, put together the, our systems. So we take a mix of, uh, um, you know, we take, we take the hardware, we take a mix of open source, we, uh, distro OSs, and then we've got uh, third-party software like the ARM uh, toolchain, and we've got some open source software, and then we've got a very, very little amount of HPE uh, specific so homegrown software. We limit it to areas where we think we can add value, and those are things like system management and monitoring, because some of these larger systems are very highly integrated, um, and so you can't take an off-the-shelf management and monitoring system and expect it to run some of these highly integrated systems. Um, and we have our own MPI. Um, we find that uh, being able to be responsive to problems at scale still has use. Uh, most people have multiple MPIs on their system, and so they will, they'll be building against multiple MPIs when they hit problems, and so, uh, you know, if you hit a problem with our MPI, we're able to, you know, turn things around very quickly. But that's not an ARM-specific thing for us, but we port it as to ARM, it's available. Um, I think, um, you heard uh, Andrew talk about uh, ATSI, uh, the Advanced Trilab Software Environment, um, and so we're, we're actually, when they when Sandia articulated their vision for ATSI uh, to us, it was a very parallel track to an internal program that we're putting together, uh, that we're working on, uh, has shares many of the same goals and much of the same vision, and so we're we're collaborating with Sandia. Um, and uh, the external representation, our representation of that is something we're calling, uh, temporarily calling uh, the Open Leadership Software Stack. So uh, that's the name it's currently under. It's just an engineering name for what we're doing. And we're, we're looking at building a, uh, a, a software stack that is suitable for leadership class systems. There's, and if people want to talk about why you can't just drop open HPC onto a system like this. I'm more than happy to talk about it, but that's not the subject of this talk. So catch me later if you want to, if you want to talk about that. Uh, but we're collaborating closely with them. You can see this slide, we actually specifically call out the OS as being Rails 7.5. Um, you know, that's what our contract says, um, but we're working with Sandia to, to stand up TOS on the system because TOS is basically their in-house version of Rails 7.5. So, um, and we've been working with uh, Lawrence Livermore on TOS too. So, very excited uh, about this system. Um, I want to talk about the software ecosystem advancements in the last 12 months. And a lot of these, specifically, I, I think a lot of these have been uh, brought into existence or accelerated through the Comanche program. So, for instance, RHEL for ARM was announced at Supercomputing last year. That was after this conference. So. You know, um, John Masters stood up here last year and talked about good things that were going to happen, and then it was announced that uh, RHEL were going to actually uh, fully, fully support ARM at, at SC. Um, turns out the Apollo 70 is the first ARM-based server to be certified with SLES, SLES 12. Um, and actually, the RHEL certification for the Apollo 70 is complete, the technical work's complete, the formal announcement's waiting on some logistics. So. Uh, I won't bore you with that. Uh, Melanox OFED and HPCX are now available for ARM, so you can just go get those. Um, Liv Lawrence Livermore's TOS, Trilab Operating System Stack, they added the ARCH64 target. So, um, Lustre Client, I think the bulk of that heavy lifting there was done at Oak Ridge, um, and um, I think uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, uh, again, that I think we think 212 works out of the box, um, and uh, so a lot, a lot of work's gone into that. Um, so that, that's, a big, that's a big step forward too. Arm Linear Studio's come a long way in the last 15 months too. So uh, that, that's a great thing. Um, I want to also point out that um, Arm have actually been 
uh, submitting, there's been a flurry of activity from, from ARM in terms of actually making OpenHPC, OpenHPC support, supported ARM for a while, but there's been a flurry of activity actually supporting ARM with the ARM toolchain, the ARM targets with the ARM toolchain. That's been another great step forward uh, for OpenHPC. Um, and at HPE, you know, we've, we've, we've released HPE MPI and our uh, system management software. And so we can take, you know, uh, we can manage ARM compute nodes either from ARM head nodes or from x86 head nodes. Um, we, we haven't actually solved the problem of managing x86 nodes from ARM head nodes yet because we had to pick our battles. So, um, so that's all happened in the last 12 months since the last conference. Um, and so the big thing for me here is I didn't just want to come up and say, oh, you know, here's what's happened and, um, and just, you know, pat, pat ourselves on the back. I wanted to actually say that from a vendor standpoint, I think we've got some work to do as a community. As someone that works on, on future bids and talks to customers about procurements, you know, many, several years out, um, I think we've, um, we've got a way to go. I, if I had to say there was a theme of this, this day, the, the, this um, session last year, it was making things boring. It was getting to the point where you, know, you could just put an ARM system together and it was boring. Um, I think we've achieved that at least for a lot of people who are at the bleeding edge. Well, maybe not at Astra scale. That thing's boring at Astra scale. I mean, so, but it's only 2,600 nodes, but that's non-trivial. Um, but, you know, you can buy a commercial OS for it. There's a part number for it. You can buy a, you can buy a tool chain for it. There's a part number for it. You can buy a box from a tier one vendor now. There's a part number for it. You can get support. You can get, it's not, you know, it, it's not a stretch anymore. And so we've achieved that. And I, I realise that that's probably really only super easy for early adopters. But, you know, the rest will get pulled through. That's fine. What we've got to do next is we've got to take that and um, not, sit, not rest on our laurels. And I think people have shown a lot of graphs to show that ARM, has, uh, Arm today has got compelling performance. It's got very compelling price performance. It's, um, but, you know, a lot of the graphs are like, well, it's only a little bit less than Skylake. We don't, you still don't win machines if you're competitively unless you're at par, and I think a lot of people are looking at SVE to unlock that last little piece of the puzzle. And so, um, you know, so you can really compete against ABX 512. So I think a lot of people are looking for that. So as a community, how do we, this is not gonna happen overnight, how do we work together to actually get there? How do we work on being able to deliver and unlock that potential performance that, that, that's being burnt into silicon as we speak? And so I think one of the big things is we need to work on uh, the open toolchain support. Um, you know, I think both GCC and LLVM, specifically because I think you know, a lot of GCC work, that'll happen, be, and a lot of CLLVM work will happen just because of the greater community. Frankly, only the HPC community is gonna make Fortran work. You know, the buck stops in this room for Fortran, right? So, let's, uh, so we've, got to, we've got to figure something out there. Um, I think we've got an interesting ride ahead of us for the next uh, few years because while I think the DOE did a fantastic thing to get uh, PGI, they, you know, they, they um, paid PGI to produce, uh, to, to open source their Fortran front end as Flang, I, I think what's emerged from that process is that Flang will never be accepted into the LVM tree. And so, uh, PGI have actually spun up a separate project recently, this is within the last six months, called F18. And so we've got an interesting landscape ahead of us where you've got to choose, if, you, if, well, if you're in limited resources, you have to choose, to, what, what do I put into Flang, what do I put into F18? And that transition is going to change, that, you know, that mix is going to change over the next two years or something. So I'm trying to think two years out, what is it going to take to actually have a competitive system two years out? You know, Two and a half years from now, you probably don't want to be spinning up work on Flang. You probably want to be spinning up work on F18. Tomorrow, you probably want to be working on Flang. I don't know how much of that work's going to carry over. 
But um, I think this is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, broad library support. Um, I don't just mean math libraries there. I mean I.O. libraries, you know, the, the whole enchilada people, people drew up there. So getting, getting broad support for those things to be built under ARM, to be built with SVE, and to be, uh, uh, to be optimal, or at least, uh, at least exploiting S SVE, will be, will be important. Um, there's another little side thing is, I don't know, um, uh, Simon McIntosh-Smith from, uh, from Bristol, again, has got another thing that SVE is not only useful for compute. If you actually let a compiler loose on it properly, or vectorization is not only good for compute, it actually unleashes your, your underlying memory bandwidth. So I encourage you to look for a paper from, uh, from Bristol that actually talks through that, uh, how vectorization actually... Uh, helps you uh, exploit memory bandwidth. And so I think that's going to be another key thing because a lot of the designs that I'm seeing, um, they've got, um, you know, they've either got HBM on them or they've got the high, you know, they've got lots of, they offer lots of memory bandwidth because I think, you know, the ARM community's got the uh, flexibility, the ARM ecosystem has the flexibility to provide that. Um, you know, we've got to work together to drive and simplify the, the application workflow availability. What, you know, this builds on the make things boring achievements, and I think you can see that we're trying to push that envelope with, uh, with programs like, uh, like Catalyst UK. I think Michelle talked about, you know, what they're doing is that we didn't just, we didn't create a scheme where we said, here, give this to a bunch of PhDs and just let them, you know, wiggle on it for a while. We, we said, you know, here are some actual tasks we want to see you get done. We want to see you port some applications. We want to see you actually measure some stuff. And so you can see each, each, each site is taking their approach and their specialization and, and running with it. And so I, I think it's important we've got to think about application and workflow, not micro, not micro benchmarks. Um, the other thing that um, I, want to, uh, I want to stress is I think collaboration and openness here are crucial. I think there's something fundamentally different about the ARM ecosystem, and um, certainly my group are approaching it in a fundamentally different way. And so I think you've seen, um, you know, you saw Dan in, uh, early on saying, I'm looking for ways to collaborate. You know, I think HPE's uh, demonstrated that we want to find ways to collaborate. We put programs like Catalyst together, we put programs like uh, Comanche together. Um, I'm here to try and find out who wants to collaborate, how can we, how can we divvy, divvy tasks up, how can we, uh, how can we um, work together to, counter, uh, to tackle these problems. So um, I think there's something unique, uh, there's a unique opportunity here with the ARM ecosystem. I think the way it's structured differently that you've got ARM as an IP vendor and um, doing some enabling, uh, fundamental enabling work, and then you've got people like Kavi and Fujitsu and, uh, and others uh, actually making silicon. I think there's something fundamentally different about that. It's collaborative. You don't end up with just an NDA with a vendor, and you can't talk about anything with anyone else. So, um, and with that, that's all I've got to say. And so I apologize. Some of it was a bit repetitive from the, the talks that went on before. But uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to answer them. If anyone's got any collaboration opportunities that they see, that I haven't, so please suggest them. Exactly, we have plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion, so we have a Roxana effect. Thank you. So Andy, um, thank you very much, very good talk. A quick question, what has been your biggest challenge in working with us, with ARM? <laughs> I, it's, no, no, it's, is that the royal us or is that ARM in particular? With, no, with the ARM ecosystem in general, not just with us as ARM, but like with the ARM ecosystem. Um, I think that the, the issues have mostly been structural. It's structured so differently from the other ecosystems that we, uh, that we work with, that as an organization, HPE, you know, we find before we maybe had, we maybe had to talk to one product manager or maybe two, someone for hardware and someone for, someone for software. Now we've got to talk to maybe three organizations, three completely different companies and maybe a couple of product managers from, or engineers from each company. So that's been, it's, 
it's both a strength and a weakness. It's just, uh, it's been, that's been something we've had to come to terms with, just, just the structural differences. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, any more questions? Just raise your hand. Okay. Oh, we got one over there, Andrew. Do we think that OpenHPC is the right tool or a right tool for collaboration or should we be drawing different collaborative boxes around this? I think we should see if we can make, see if, we've got, as a, as a, as a community, we've got needs. If OpenHPC can meet those needs, then great. If it can't, then we'll find another vehicle or whatever. If, if uh, that's, I'm not trying to be diplomatic or anything, I'm just trying to say that I, I, think, I think it doesn't change what we need, especially at the leadership class. If I was, you know, I would have no reservations dumping open HPC as is on a catalyst size cluster. 64 nodes, 4,000 cores, drop it on. You know, the Astro, size machine, 2,600 nodes, then that's, you know, that's, that requires a little bit more finesse, I think. And it's not a knock on OpenHPC, it's OpenHPC targeted a given section of the market. Um, it doesn't happen to be, I, you know, full disclosure, I work in the advanced technologies group at, uh, at HPE. I don't do small clusters. So, um, I, I don't, there's a, there's a number of shortcomings that I feel OpenHPC has at leadership classes, and people quite happily come up and ask me what I think they are, and I'll, I'll enumerate them. So, and it's not meant as a slam on OpenHPC at all. It's just, that's just not, that wasn't its target, de target demographic. If we want to, I, I explicitly am you know, making efforts to reach out to, to see if that, if, if OpenHPC as an organisation with a governance model is interested in finding ways to address this market. So, and I'm open-minded about how that plays out. All right, any other questions? Nope, all right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. All right, and unfortunately our last speaker um, is gonna be, well, a no-show for today. So, I think we're gonna do something a little bit different. And if anybody has any discussion points they'd like to open the floor with, we could actually just have a round-the-room discussion. We have two mics, we could just open the floor to questions. And if we spend like 45 seconds and no one takes me up on the discussion, then we are gonna break early and head to the pub. Going once, going twice. Well, wow, nobody has any discussion questions points. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks guys for coming. It's been an awesome uh, day, lots of information, lots of good stuff. And have fun with the rest of the ARM Research Summit. Enjoy your time in Cambridge. Thanks. <laughs>